All right. You guys ready to go? It's gonna be a great night. It is a really special night. If you are joining us uh, live or online, we've got a treat for you. I've got my pastor, Jimmy Evans, is here to preach tonight. And for those of you who know him, I know you love him and you've been very excited that he's coming. Uh, so am I and so are we. And if you're new, this is gonna be a real treat for you. Uh, pastor Jimmy has been walking with us for about a decade. He was uh, the man that I spoke to, one of the men that I spoke to and asked to pray about whether or not we should start this church. And he serves as wise counsel and spiritual father and pastor. He said that this was God's will. He prophesied this building into being. He served as a founding overseer here at our church. And uh, most excited, I'm gonna go to dinner with him and Grace tonight. So that's the highlight of my week. So, um, and so Pastor Jimmy, we love you, we honor you, we thank you. And thank you for coming to visit our church family and to bless our family. I told him he could speak on whatever he wanted. He's got a very powerful sermon for you on breaking generational curses and strongholds. For some of you, this is literally gonna change the destiny of your family and legacy for generations. So with that, I just wanna thank you, Pastor Jimmy, for being here, welcome you up. And why don't you just give him a very warm welcome. I'm getting older. I can't make it up here before y'all stop clapping. <laughs> y'all need to clap just a little bit longer for the old guy. So, no. It is wonderful to be here. I just, this church is amazing. I was here last year and I, I drove up today. Everything has changed. Everything's better. You guys have added on. And congratulations on your capital campaign. And Pastor Mark brags on you guys all the time. Just what an amazing group. Amazing church. I'm honored to be a part of it. Pastor Mark and Grace treat me incredibly. They're taking me out to eat dinner tonight, and then tomorrow they're taking me to an Arizona, Arizona Diamondback game. Yeah. I actually saw the Diamondbacks play not too long ago, uh, last October, when my Rangers were playing against them in the <laughs> World Series. See, let me tell you something. First of all, I'm from Texas. I'm obnoxious, but... We, we win so little in Dallas that when we win, we're just totally obnoxious about it. So forgive me for being a little obnoxious about it. But the Diamondbacks are a fantastic team. They're fantastic. Okay. So this message is on breaking generational bondages. Now, uh, so much of who we are today comes from our parents, from our moms and dads, grandparents, things like that. Um, all of us have good things in our past. Uh, sometimes it's hard to find. You have to look real hard, but, but we are thankful for the good things. But a lot of us have bad things in our past. Wouldn't it be wonderful when you're growing up if someone would tell you how to deal with all that stuff? Yeah. And sometimes they do if you were raised in a godly family. I grew up in a devastatingly dysfunctional home. A suicidal mother who was mentally ill. Uh, just my father was checked out. Uh, Karen, my wife, uh, she was raised in a home. Her mother, uh, when my, her mother was 14 years old, uh, she lost her arm and leg in a farming accident on her uncle's farm. Beautiful woman. And um, she, when she was in the hospital recovering from losing her arm and leg, her parents didn't come see her. And uh, her mother told the other siblings, when she came home, don't do anything for her, make her do everything on her own. And my mother-in-law is just the most amazing. She's 95 years old. She's still alive. Uh, she's just a wonderful person. But she went through devastating pain growing up. Her, her mother, Karen's grandmother, is the meanest person I've ever met. Uh, I met her one time. I didn't want to meet her again. And uh, she was just mean as a junkyard dog. And so my family, mental illness on my side, a bunch of issues on Karen's side. So marriage counseling, I'm the president and founder of XO Marriage, and uh, we find in marriage counseling more and more, it's not the marriage issues that are the issue, it's who you were coming into the marriage. So more and more we're focusing on the damage, the generational issues, the, the things like that. And so Karen and I got married at 19 years old. Now our families, if you'd have seen our families, Karen's parents were very successful people, very attractive people. Uh, my mother was a model when I was growing up. She had mental issues and things like that, but she was a model, very pretty woman. Uh, my dad, my, my parents were successful. The, my parents said they were Methodists, but they were heathens. They, they were not saved. <laughs> I led my parents to the Lord when I was a pastor. And so Karen's parents were, thank you. Well, yeah, 
they're both with Jesus now. They're, they're wonderful. They, they loved me and they, uh, all the issues of my past were resolved for just through the Lord. But Karen's parents would say they were Presbyterian when they were growing up, but they weren't saved. They got saved later on too. But we came into marriage devastated. I mean, just literally devastated. Now, if you would have asked me, if 19 years old, if I was devastated, I would have said no, because I was like everybody else in my family. Uh, I was like everybody else that I knew, and I didn't know Jesus. But when Karen and I got saved, we began to hear messages like the one I'm going to bring you here. Now, I'm going to say I am a 100% transformed person because of the grace of Jesus. Yes. And the message that I'm going to bring here, it, Pastor Mark said, it will change you and your family for generations. It will. Some of you have never heard a message like this. It will change you and your family for generations. And I'm very thankful. You know, this is, we're looking at Palm Sunday leading into Easter next week. Aren't you thankful for the healing that we have in Jesus Christ? Yes. He's a healer. And that doesn't just mean our bodies. That means our souls. That means our minds. So I, I want to talk about the issue of generational transference. This is De Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 9. I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. I'm a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers to the children to the fourth, third and fourth generations. When it says fathers, that, that word there also means just parents. And so the word iniquity is the word avon in the Hebrew language. And it means to bend or twist. It's just this picture here. Rather than being straight, it's bent and twisted. And God says, I'm going to visit the iniquities of the parents to the children to the third and fourth generation. So if you see a word picture, it's like a tree that's blown by prevailing wind. And after a period of time, that tree is bent. That's literally what the word means. The influence in our home and close culture when we're growing up, and even before we know the Lord as adults, makes deep impressions on us, good or bad, for the future. And if it's good, we grow up straight. If the, if the things that we experienced at our homes were righteous and right and biblical, then we grow up as we should. But if they were sin if they were negative, if they were compromised, if they were corrupt or whatever, then we grow up bent. We have that bent from our families, that generational tendency. Our parents and culture can pl place things within us that we're not aware of. And this is what happened to me. There were things deeply within me that I had no idea that were there until the Lord exposed it and took care of it. Let me give you an example of this truth from history. Uh, in 1906, a study was released that compared the descendants of the 18th century evangelist Jonathan Edwards with another man who lived at the same time. His name was Max Jukes. The two men were total opposites. Max Jukes was a drunk with very low values. Jonathan Edwards and his wife raised their family in a strong Christian environment. And here's a record of their known descendants as of 1906. There were 14 college presidents came directly from them. 14 college presidents, more than 100 college professors, more than 100 lawyers, 30 judges, and 60 physicians, more than 100 clergymen, missionaries, and theology professors, 60 authors, three senators, and a vice president of the United States from one couple, from one godly couple. That shows you the power of the generational influence there. Max Jukes did not raise his family. He often disappeared for days, drunk, and then came home later. It's estimated that Max Jukes and his family and descendants had, by 1906, cost the state of New York $12 million. That would be over $100 million today. One family had cost the state of New York that much money. Uh, as of 1906, Max Jukes had produced 300 descendant, 310 descendants in poverty, 150 criminals, 100 drunks, seven murderers, and one half of his female descendants were prostitutes. So that's the power of generational transference. One truth is our lives are generationally connected and have the power to transmit righteousness or sin, health or unhealth, blessing or cursing, wealth or poverty, education or ignorance, pleasure or pain. We're connected. What I'm saying to you is you have generations of people that you're connected to. If you haven't dealt with these issues, you are right now connected to generations of people that you're not even aware of, our life, good or bad. Some of that may be good, some of it may be bad. The other thing that we need to understand is we decide our legacy and have the power to change our generational inheritance. We change, a, a Max Jukes bloodline can become a Jesus Christ bloodline. And so when Karen and I 
we were in our 20s, our early 20s, and, and we, were, we were, had been Christians for three or four years. And we were coming to terms with, I heard a teaching on one of the things I'm going to talk about here in just a minute. And I heard a teaching on this, and it was on iniquities. That's what I'm going to talk about next. And it's the tendency toward a sin because of the sins of our parents. And Karen and I heard this teaching, and when we came home, and her maiden name was Smith. And we came home, and here's what we said to each other. We're the end of all generational curses in both sides. All the Smith curses and sins and iniquities, all the Evans curses and sins ends with us and our children. And our grandchildren yes. will inherit a blessing to a thousand generations. Amen. And we were with our little grandkids at spring break a couple of weeks ago, and our twin granddaughters last night, they're 22. And our grandchildren have no idea. They're so blessed. They have no idea the families that we came out of. And I'm so thankful they have no idea. So you can choose. You may be single. This is the perfect time to deal with these issues. You may be divorced. Dealing with these issues actually prepares you to be married. But if you're married, you're connected. All the iniquities and problems of the past, if they haven't been dealt with, they're connected. So let's talk about dealing with how to stop a negative legacy and begin a legacy of blessing. We're going to deal with iniquities, inner vows, and the issue of forgiveness in this message. Iniquities inner vows, and forgiveness. Again, uh, iniquity just means to bend or to twist. The power of parenting, parents have the most powerful influence on a child, period, good or bad. This is Deuteronomy 5, uh, or Deuteronomy 6. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house. When you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as a frontlet between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. So the Lord commanded the children of Israel to diligently teach their children the word of God. That is still true today. This is Ephesians 6, 4. It says, you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord, uh, the men should be the leaders of the home. Uh, husband sh uh, leadership is one of the deepest needs that women have. Women want to be treated as equals. Women are equal, totally equal. Women want to be treated as equal, but one of the number one needs that women have is for their husband to be a leader. That means the loving initiator of the finances, the children, romance, spirituality, treating her as an equal. But you're the leader, and you lead with the children. And the interesting thing here in Deuteronomy 6... It says, you shall teach them diligently to your children when you sit in the house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Did you know those are the four most contemplative times of the day? When you're most open and when you're most tempted to sin. When you're laying in bed at night, when you're laying in bed in the morning, when you're sitting around the house, or when you're in the car. Of course, they didn't have cars, but when they were going places. Those are the four most contemplative times of the day, and that's the most important time for us to put the Word of God into our minds. Yeah. And so what God was saying is, fathers, fathers, when your children are in a contemplative time, you teach them the word of God. You diligently teach them the word of God. Ephesians 4, the, the Bible tells the same thing. So the power of parenting is profound. A parent's behavior has an influence on their family for at least three generations. Whether you like it or not, good or bad, intentional, unintentional, a parent's behavior, you're affecting your great-grandchildren whether you realize it or not. And so this is, this is the point there. And so uh, examples of iniquities, again, I'm going to visit the iniquities of parents. Uh, an iniquity is a tendency toward a sin or a negative behavior because of the example of my parents. See, sin is sin, but iniquities are generational. They're, they're, they're trained sins. It's something that every day, all day long, I was exposed to this. My video and audio recorders have this on video a thousand times of my parents doing this. So I'm naturally going to have the tendency to do that. Anger, substance abuse, chauvinism, it was a big one in my family, sexism, physical abuse, 
racism, bigotry, verbal abuse, immorality, pride, sexual abuse, negativity, dishonesty, materialism, perfectionism, lying, gossip, unforgiveness, greed, conditional love, cynicism, unbelief, all of those are examples of iniquities. And I could go on and on and on. In my family, one of the worst sins of our, my family was chauvinism. And in my family, the, the men were very, very strong men, and the women were very docile and waited on the men hand and foot. And when I was a boy growing up, I just thought, A, that's of the Lord. <laughs> and B, I want one of those. <laughs> and so I married Karen, but she never trained well. It was, it was always a problem, still a problem today. <laughs> and so literally, the men in my family, they just, the women were just subservient to the men. And I just, so one of the, one of the iniquities that I had to break, it would, would almost cost our marriage, was the issue of chauvinism. So iniquities are generationally entrenched sins. And so you have the natural tendency to do, and so like this, here's some questions. We're going to find out if you have iniquities. So this is discovery. Okay, so here's some questions. Were the things you were exposed to while you were growing up biblically sound and morally correct? Just a question. And so were they, the things that you were exposed to growing up, were they biblical? Were they morally sound? The way that people in your family resolve conflict. In my family, uh, and we're Welsh, we're stoic. So in my family, if someone was mad at you, they just didn't look at you. I never saw conflict handled righteously in my family growing up. So if someone wasn't looking at you, you knew they were mad. And when they started looking at you again, you, they, you knew they were over it. <laughs> and so I went to Karen's house, and her family was like a bunch of demon-possessed Italians. <laughs> and they would get mad and start screaming, yelling, love you. And then 10 minutes later, they're all crying, hugging each other. And I'm thinking, these people are, they need to learn how to not to look at each other. <laughs> And so, the way your family handled money, how they handled money, the way your parents treated others, attitudes about the opposite sex, attitudes towards submission to God in the Bible. I heard uh, a member of my family say one time, the minute I can't do exactly what I want to do, I want to die and go to hell. That's a real righteous comment, isn't it? Attitudes toward children and values in life. I told you about Karen's grandparents not coming to their um, daughter's hospital when she lost an arm and a leg. We were in Ireland, uh, and my mother-in-law, Jane, her brother and sister were there, and this conversation came up. My mother-in-law has never said a negative word about her parents, and her brother, George, uh, they were talking about their parents, and George said, we had terrible parents, Jane. My mother-in-law said, they weren't so bad. And George said, they didn't even come to the hospital when you lost your arm and leg. And she said, well, I made it just fine. He said, Jane, I played in a championship baseball game a mile from our house, and my parents wouldn't come to the game. Don't tell me that's normal. See, those values, the values your parents put on stuff and things like that. So that's number one. The things that you were exposed to, was it biblical? Was it morally sound? Do you practice the same things you didn't agree with or like about your parents? See, a lot of times we gripe about our parents, but we become just like them. In fact, when you're exposed to negative stuff, you're going to have to try real hard not to be like them. And this, this message is about that. So my dad, growing up, he was uh, not relational, to say the least. He was checked out. But my dad was a finger snapper. And he would get mad. He, little man, you know, my, my brothers and I still call each other little man. Just little man, little man. Little, 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 oh, boy. I hated that. Don't you cook the finger. So our daughter, Julie, she's 49, but when she was like two or three, one of the times she was getting in trouble or something, I said, Julie, it just went off. I didn't cock it or anything. It just went off. But no. That's what happens. You, you saw it over and over and over and over. It's just your archive. It's just your default setting. You just saw it over and over and over. And so, do you practice the same things? Many times you do. Have you ever dealt properly with these things that you viewed as being wrong? Abuse suffered. You, you, you would think that a person that was abused would be the last person that would ever abuse, but that's not true. People that are abused, it becomes their default setting. Many times, not always. 
but sometimes. Wrong behavior that we protect and excuse is a family trait. And sometimes you say, well, that's just the way the Evans are. The Evans are just chauvinists. The Evans are just whatever like that. Well, that, that's, the question is not who your family was. The question is, who is Jesus Christ? Is it right? Is this something, and is this something I want to transfer to another generation? All of us come into marriage with baggage that we need to get set free from. The iniquities that we haven't dealt with hinder our relationships with God and others in a significant manner and keep perpetuating the hurt. And that's what happens. So here's, we're gonna pray in just a little bit in the message, we're gonna stop and pray for all this. But here's how to break iniquities. Number one, you recognize the problem is a sin. If it's a sin, you call it a sin, you call it whatever it is. Okay, like in my case, it was chauvinism, it might be pride, it might be materialism, cynicism, anger, Uh, you know, abuse, whatever it is. You just call it what it is. I'm talking about your behavior. I'm not talking about your parents. Okay, the second is you take responsibility for the sin or problem. You're not gonna go through life blaming somebody else. That I'm I'm the way I am because of how messed up I am or or how messed up my family was. You're that way today. Tomorrow you won't be that way because Jesus is gonna set you free. Okay, so we call it what it is. I take responsibility for my sin Number three is forgive your parents. And so um, they have baggage too. So my mother-in-law was verbally abusive to Karen, horribly verbally abusive to Karen. When I married Karen, my wife was a very beautiful woman. My wife thought she was ugly and God hated her when I met her, a very beautiful woman. Her mother just butchered her to to this day, to this day. uh, My mother-in-law, she's a Christian, she's a sweet woman. She'll still say things to Karen that hurt her all the time. It's just, and, but I look at her mother and I think she is a jewel compared to her mother. <laughs> and so our parents, your parents handed you baggage, but somebody handed it to them. My dad was just such a strange guy. He just would come home, uh, he worked all the time. He would come home, just sit in a chair, uh, wouldn't talk. My father never touched me when I was growing up. Uh, he wouldn't talk. I'd say, daddy, What's two plus two? He said, I don't know. He just totally disengaged. And my mother told me one time something she shouldn't have said. I played sports, and I asked my dad to come, football, baseball, every, all the games I had. He never came to a game. And my mother told me one time, yeah, she said, the bo- his boss keeps telling him to take off, but he won't take off. I thought, you shouldn't have told me that. Because I'm sitting here fantasizing that other guys' dads are my dad. And he's telling me he has to work. And you're telling me he can take off. So my aunts, my, my dad had nine brothers and sisters. And he would never talk about his childhood. So I have two aunts that are normal. And <laughs> I, I don't eight or nine. So Judith and Peggy. So we were sitting one time talking. And I was 40 years old, 45 years old. And so they were talking about their childhood, which I had never heard about. And my aunt... Peggy said, yeah, we slept outside every night on cots. And I said, wait a minute, who slept outside on cots? I said, well, all of us. And I said, wait, why did you sleep outside? Well, we had a one-room house during the Depression. We had to sleep outside. In the wintertime, we slept with the horses. I said, you talking about my dad? Yeah, your, your father. And uh, I said, he slept outside? Yeah. And, uh, and they, they started laughing. They said, well, we, we didn't have any shoes. We grew up on a farm. We didn't know we were poor. We didn't have anything to compare it to. But when your dad went to school when he was in first grade, he walked in with overalls on with no shirt and no shoes, and he saw other children dressed with shoes on, and he ran out in the schoolyard and grabbed a tree and wouldn't let go until his parents came get him. Well, my father grew up in abject poverty during the Depression. They ate meat once a week. They were so poor. And my father, as strange as he was, he put a covering over my head. I saw him as being a guy that was just checked out. He was doing for me what wasn't done for him. Whatever somebody handed you, somebody handed it to them. And a lot of times, my parents and Karen's parents were better people than they should have been based on where they were. Forgive your parents. You have to forgive them. We're going to talk about that more. I'm going to talk about forgiveness. The next area is submit the affected sinner area to Jesus and let him be your role model 
You need to be discipled. In the area where you have an iniquity, now you need to be discipled. Church, men's groups, women groups, life groups, church is where you get discipled. But also you just go to the Lord and say, Lord, I submit money to you. I submit relationships to you. I submit my emotions to you. I submit this to you. And now I want you to teach me, to heal me and teach me how to deal with people of the opposite sex, how to deal with these issues. And he will. Jesus said in John 16, when the Holy Spirit comes, he'll lead you into all truth. And that means all truth. Anything you need to know, the Holy Spirit's there to help you learn it. And here's number, number five in dealing with iniquities. Break the iniquity in Jesus' name. We're going to do that in just a minute. And as we get to the point of saying, in the name of Jesus, I break this iniquity off of me and all of my children, descendants after me, in Jesus' name. This, this has no more spiritual power over our family. So those are iniquities. The second is inner vows. Now, the inner vows is kind of the opposite of iniquities. The, uh, this is a definition. Uh, inner vow is a self-directed promise resulting from an unpleasant experience or hurt from a life situation by a parent or someone else. You're going through something. You're going through something hurtful. This is an example of inner, inner vows. Statements like this, I'll never treat my children like that. I'll never spank my children. I'll never make my kids wear hand-me-downs. I'll never be poor again. I'll never make my kids work like this. This is a big one. No one's ever going to hurt me again. I'll never let my husband or wife treat me like that. So we're going through, we're going through a bad situation and we are hurting, and so we make ourselves a promise. That's what an inner vow is. We make ourselves a promise, and we don't do it because we're bad people. We're doing it because we don't want to come back here again. I don't want to be poor again. I don't want to get hurt again. I don't want to be back here again. And so, and I've never met a person without an iniquity, and I've never met a person without an inner vow. These are very, very common. The problems with inner vows is, number one, they're unscriptural, Matthew 5. Jesus, again, you have heard that was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but you shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black, but let your yes be yes, and your no be no, for whatever is more than this is from the evil one. Now that's a big statement. He's saying, if you're the kind of person that goes around swearing stuff and promising stuff to yourself or somebody else, that's evil. Well, that's, this is James 4. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. So in both cases, this promising and making statements is called evil. Well, here's the question is, why is it called evil? Why, why do both of these texts say that when we start promising things and saying things like that, that it's evil? It's because when inner, inner vows are controlling us, Jesus isn't. In any area of your life where you have an inner vow, Jesus is not the Lord of that area. You say, I'll never be poor again. Jesus is not the Lord of your finances. No one will ever hurt me again. Jesus Christ is not the Lord of your relationships. The highest loyalty we have is to our own vows. If I don't do anything else, I'm going to keep that vow. And so a lot of times we're following a vow. We don't even know it. We made a vow back when, but it just has kind of a railroad track effect on our lives. And everything that we're doing, we're following this inner vow. The other thing that inner vows do, they, call, they cause us to overreact and to be unteachable and unapproachable. When you have an inner vow, let me say it another way. When you have an inner vow working in that area, you're a little crazy. You think you're a genius. You're a little crazy. And when people try to, it's like a drunk man trying to get on a horse. Just keeps falling off both sides. You just can't get on the horse. You just can't, can't make any progress. And so wherever you have an inner vow, you're mildly insane. So I, uh, I had a guy that I counseled in his marriage. And this friend of mine said, would you talk to my buddy? His wife is about to divorce him. And I said, yeah. So I talked to this guy. And so I was talking to him. And he was talking about his wife. And he kept referring to her house. And I said, do you live separately? He said, yeah. And I said, 
um, are you separated? He said, no. I said, um, well, you're married. You don't live together? No. I said, so why don't you live together? He said, I don't want her in the house. <laughs> I said, you married her and you don't want her in the house? He said, I just don't want her in the house. Said, What's wrong with that? I said, that's very odd, that number one. <laughs> that's just very odd. I have a gift of subtlety. And I said, she's very odd. And I said, so tell me, tell me what's going on here. Why won't you let your wife in the house? He said, because I grew up with a mother who emasculated my father every day of my life, and I swore I'd never have a woman in the house to do that to me. I said, oh, so now you are your mother. I have a gift of subtlety. And I mean, he looked at me, he said, what did you say? I said, you're way worse than your mother. Your mother at least let your dad stay in the house. And he looked at me. He said, there's nothing wrong with what I'm doing. I said, well, I don't blame her for divorcing you. If you wouldn't let me in the house, I'd divorce you too. <laughs> and so I talked to his wife, and what if she divorced him? He wouldn't let her in the house. Oh, and there's one other little thing. He lived in a $3 million mansion. She lived in a two-bedroom apartment. Oh. Mr. Wonderful. And so, <laughs> so he's crazy. Now, this guy's a very successful guy, very intelligent guy. But it, it, concerning women and marriage, he's a nut. So growing up, he watched his mother emasculate his father. No woman will ever do that to me. So he became just like her. Um, when I was growing up, um, we grew up poor. You know, I did live in poverty, but we grew up poor. And when I was like in high school, I had two shirts and one pair of pants. That's, that was my entire wardrobe. And I told my parents one time, uh, I said, when I have two older brothers, Damien and Lucifer, and the, no. Randy and Mike. But I told my parents, I said, when y'all go take Randy and Mike to go shopping, can I go? Because I'm going to end up wearing all this stuff. And I really have to go. I just didn't have any clothes. And so I had two shirts and one pair of pants. And Karen said to me one day, she said, I thought you wore that shirt all the time because you liked it. I said, well, I only had two. But I remember standing in front of my closet when I was, you know, like, like in high school, looking at my clothes, and I just thought, you know, if I ever get any money, I'm gonna have clothes. So fast forward 20 years, and Karen and I were having a fight, and she said, Jimmy, you have too many clothes. Stop buying clothes. I said, our closets are too small. <laughs> and I'm gonna fix that problem right now. <laughs> I mean, literally, when I went into a clothing store, it's just I was not sane. And I, want, I wanted clothes. I had clothes. Sure did. Uh, a friend of mine uh, was growing up, and his mom wouldn't let soft drinks in the house. Um, and so he would have friends over to the house, and they had water or tea, or the, she wouldn't allow soft drinks in the house. So he said, um, uh, when I grow up, I'm going to have a Coke machine in my living room. <laughs> So we, I didn't know this. So we went to their home one day after church. They invited us over to their home. And we went over to their home, and he said, you want a Coke? I mean, right when I walked in the door, you want a Coke? I said, sure. So he pours me a Coke, Diet Coke, pours a Coke. And so I'm drinking it. I'm not, he's unbelievably attentive to my glass. And so we get like, you know, a half down. He all, so he opens his cupboard over here to get the Cokes out. And I've never seen that many carbonated beverages outside a grocery store. I mean, it's just like, whoa, he's a man. And so he took care of it. So he and his wife got in a big fight one day in the grocery store uh, because she was pushing the cart. He was pulling all these big liter bottles of you know, soda down in there. She said, stop it. Our kids' teeth are rotting out. Stop it. And don't you ever tell me. And boy, they got mad. He was crazy, just a little bit crazy. Otherwise, a wonderful person. But when it came to soft drinks, he was a nut. <laughs> so wherever you have, an, so let me say this. Where you're really defensive, you probably have an inner vow going on. Where people can't talk to you, you probably have an inner vow going on. And that, that's what it does. Here's how to break inner vows. You recognize it. When were you hurting? When were you hurting that you promised yourself something? You've done this. You didn't do it because you're a bad person. You did it because you didn't want to hurt anymore. Okay. But the, what's wrong about it is, so here, let me say this. I said earlier, wouldn't it be nice if someone were there guiding us through all that? 
So if someone would have been there guiding all of us through that and we were hurting, here's what that person would have said. Don't promise yourself you're not going to go through this again. Turn this pain to Jesus. He'll heal it. That's what we should have done. And inner vows replace Jesus. That's what's wrong. So we recognize it and then we repent. We just renounce the vow. We're going to do this in just a minute. I renounce the vow that no one's ever going to hurt me again, that no woman's ever going to treat me like that, no man's ever going to treat me like that, you know, never be poor again. I'm, I renounce the vow. I shouldn't have done it. I did it. Number three, you forgive. Who is attached to this inner vow? Is there a person, ex spouse, parent, sibling, ex business partner? Is there someone attached to this? You need to forgive them. We're going to talk about forgiveness here in just a minute. Submit it to Jesus. You come to Jesus and say, Lord, I, I need healing in this area of my life. And I, I pray that you'll, I submit this area to you and I pray that you'll heal me. And he will. And then you ask the Holy Spirit to heal you and lead you into truth in that area of your life. So you can move into the future. Here's the forgiveness. We've talked about iniquities and our vows. This is forgiveness. Everybody has to deal with this. This is, this is a huge issue. Uh, I had a young couple in counseling. I did pre I started in, uh, at 28 years old, I started in the ministry as a pre-marriage and marriage counselor. And I had a couple named Paul and Sandra, and they were a sweet couple. And I was taking them through pre-marriage counseling. And I did a, an inventory. It was called uh, the Taylor Johnson Temperament Analysis. And it analyzed nine different temperament traits in a person. They uh, answered a bunch of questions. And based on their answers, it created a profile. And it was really just an emotional profile telling you if they're in what areas where they were unhealthy. Well, one of the areas was anger. Uh, are you angry? Well, Paul rated 100% angry. About to get married. Nice guy. I, mean, I really liked him, liked Sandra. And so they came in the next week after they took the test. And I said, Paul, on your uh, test here, you rate 100% in anger. I've never seen this before. And, and Sandra then starts telling stories. He said, oh, yeah. He gets mad and goes in the garage and beats himself with wrenches. And I said, seriously? And I turned around and said, seriously? He said, well, it feels good. I said, beat yourself with wrenches? Well, you know, cut, blow off some steam. She said, he drives down the road over 100 miles an hour flipping the car, car like this, seeing if he'll flip. She said, he, he uh, puts guys in the hospital playing football and loves it. And I turned to Paul and I said, Paul, who are you mad at? And he said, I'm not mad at anybody. I said, no, you're... You're mad at somebody. <laughs> Who are you mad at? And he said, I'm not mad at anybody, Pastor Jimmy. And I said, are you mad at this person? No, this person? No, this person? I said, are you mad at your father? He said, well, I don't know the blankety blank. If I ever find him, I'm going to kill him. <laughs> I said, well, I think we're getting warm. <laughs> well, his father left his mother while she was pregnant with Paul. And so... I turned to Paul. I said, Paul, you have to forgive your father. And he hung his head and sobbed for 60 minutes. He looked up. He said, okay. So I led him in a prayer to forgive his dad. And they came back the next week. And I said, Sandra, how's Paul doing? She said, we can't make him mad. <laughs> and she said, we're trying, but we can't. All that steam in there. Unforgiveness is an invisible umbilical cord that connects us to the people and pain of our past. That's one of the ways to look at it. Whoever you hate or you're bitter at, you're connected to that person. Unforgiveness always has the worst effect on those closest to us. And so there was a guy, when I, I was 28, I was the pre-marriage and marriage pastor of our church. I would, came in from business with my parents um, the pastor left, the pastor of the church left. I'd been on staff for 10 months and he went to take a church in Florida and the elders asked me to preach until I could figure out what to do. Well, I became the preacher. They asked me to be the senior pastor of the church at 29 years old. Um, and the congregation was very nice except for a few people. <laughs> and, and there was one guy that he hated me and he, he did everything he could to run me off. He came into an elders meeting with me present and he told the elders that they had made a mistake, that they need to keep looking, I'm not the one. He would sit on the front row while I was preaching and fall asleep. In the middle of my message, he'd wake up, his watch, he'd go back to sleep. 
So he, he was campaigning in the church against me. Well, I hated his guts. <laughs> and I mean, I just hated him. And uh, I just had a little torture chamber down in my heart. I'd drag him down there 20, 25 times a day. He'd beat him up, beat him up hard. Just felt so good. I, I, I was just waiting for his obituary. <laughs> Happy, in color, with all the details. And so Karen came up to me one day and she said, your personality is changing, Jimmy. It was. You know, when you hate, there's an oppression that comes with it. This is Jesus. This is Matthew 18. Then his master, this, and by the way, Jesus is telling a ridiculous story. Uh, the ridiculous story is there was a man who owed his master a billion dollars, a billion. And he begged his master to forgive him. And his master forgave him. And then that man who had been forgiven went and found one of his fellow slaves that owed him $10,000. And he wouldn't forgive him. And he began to beat him up. This is the story. Jesus said, then his master, after he called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not have also had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. So my heavenly Father also will do to each, to to you, if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Unforgiveness is torment. Doesn't matter if you're a believer or not. Doesn't matter if you're on your way to heaven or not. Doesn't matter how much you love Jesus. When you're angry and bitter at a person, uh, unforgiveness is mental and emotional torture. It, it, it's just it puts our whole body under stress. In an unbelievable way. I heard a couple of sayings. One is, forgiveness doesn't make them right. It just makes us free. We're not saying they're right. We're just saying that we, we don't want that anymore. Uh, unforgiveness damages the vessel it's stored in worse than anything you can spit it on. It's, it's you that it's hurting and the people around you. He you said, Pastor Jimmy, I'm supposed to be here, everybody. Yes, the person who sexually abused you the person who killed your loved one, the business par partner who stole your money, your former friend, ex-spouse who betrayed you, the person who lied about you and did you harm. You have to forgive all of them without exception. There's no, Jesus gives no out for us not to forgive. You say, well, how do we do this? Because a lot of people will come to me, and I know what this feels like. Um, how do I do this? Because this is Luke 6. I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who spitefully use you. Now, this is the secret of forgiveness right here. So I hated that guy in our church and uh, just literally hated his guts. And I, Karen said, Jimmy, your, your uh, personality is changing. And so I, I said, okay. So I prayed about it the next morning and I said, Lord, I... I pray that you'll help me because I don't know what to do. And the Lord said, I want you to bless that man. And I said, no. no. I'm not blessing him. I hate him. I hate his guts. And if I pray a blessing over him and you bless him, then I've got problems with you. And so the Lord never says, you're right, Jimmy. Uh, so the Lord just, you know, kind of stood me down. So I thought, okay, well, I'm going to pray blessing on him. And... Uh, <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> so I kind of prayed a real wimpy prayer of blessing over him. The Lord said, I want you to do it every day. And I thought, oh. <laughs> so every day I'd pray a prayer. Didn't mean it. And I would just say, Lord, bless him. So then I was praying one day and the Lord said, no, you bless him the way you want to be blessed. And you bless his wife and his children. I'm just saying, Lord, this is just getting worse every day. You know. <laughs> so I, start, I blessed him. You know, blessed his family, whatever. So this went on for like 10 days. Um, and so about the 10th day, I was praying, you know, blessing over him. And I saw a vision I don't know, I don't, in my heart. I don't know how else to say it. And I was praying and I saw a 10-year-old boy, about a 10-year-old boy, and just in my heart, I'm seeing this, like on a ranch. And this boy is standing outside this ranch house by himself and he's traumatized. And what I know is something really bad just happened to that boy. And then I realized that boy is the man I hate. And the Lord said, Jimmy, you know that man for what he's done to you. I know him 
for what was done to him. From that moment on, I never hated him again. He was still a knucklehead. <laughs> you know, he didn't, he didn't start being nice that day. Never hated him again. Felt compassion for him. You know, when you hear a person's name, your blood pressure goes up. You need to pray for that person. And so, blessing forces forgiveness from our head to our heart. Blessing forces forgiveness from our head to our heart. And I've had people say to me, Pastor Jimmy, I, I've forgiven him a hundred times, but nothing changes. It won't until you bless. When Jesus said bless, that's not just a trite little scripture. That's the medicine of how you get over all this stuff. If you can't bless, you haven't forgiven. When you're blessing that person, it means I am actively forgiving this person. Blessing is what brings the healing and the peace. And you may have to do it 100 times. You may have to do it 20 times a day. But I'm telling you this, it's worth it. I, I'm not a hater, but I've, I've hated a few people real well. It would have run my life. It would have, see, Karen got the worst of it. That's what happens. It doesn't matter. Somebody can be dead, but your spouse can get the worst of it right now. In that toxic environment, some of you grew up in an environment of hate. Like the Hatfields and the McCoys, where your family, there was just this hatred there, underlying hatred that affected all the relationships and everything that went on. So let's stop for just a minute. And I want to pray. And I know there's a lot of people watching online. So glad that you guys are watching online. Wherever you are, you may be at home or you may be at your office or dorm room, hotel room, wherever you are. We're going to go through these areas. And this, the Lord is with you, just like he's here. He's with you. And so whatever I'm saying here, you just do it wherever you are there. And the Lord will heal you. The Lord will break this. So let's start with iniquities. A tendency toward a sin or behavior because of what you were exposed to growing up, okay? And again, I'll say, I've, ne I've never met a person who didn't have an iniquity. It's, it's very common. But some of you, you don't just have an iniquity. You have an iniquity that's a real problem to you in your life. It's something maybe that you hate, but you do, and, and you want it to be over with. There's a spiritual power to that that we're going to break. So I want you, if you have an iniquity, I want you to stand. If you're watching online, you can stand wherever you are. You can raise your hands or whatever. You want you to stand if you have an iniquity. And we're going to pray and we're going to break those. And so Lord, we just come before you and we just recognize that there's something that we are bent toward in a negative way. And we remember. We remember with our hearts, with our minds, with our ears, with our memories. We remember how it happened. And Lord, we call it what it is, whatever that iniquity is, just in your heart right now before the Lord, you say, Lord, it's anger, it's pride, it's cynicism, it's unbelief, it's dishonesty, it's what, whatever, it's chauvinism, sexism, racism, abuse, Whatever it might, you just call it whatever it is right there where you're standing. There may be two or three iniquities that you have. Just call them all out. Lord, we name it what it is. We call it a sin, and Lord, we repent. We take responsibility for that behavior. It's our behavior. Wherever it came from, now it's our behavior. We do not want to transfer this to another generation. And we don't want this to be our witness. We don't want this to be what other people see in us. We forgive our parents. And Lord, whatever baggage they gave us, somebody gave them baggage too. And we just give them grace, Lord. We, and we bless them. We bless our moms and dads, our stepmoms, our stepdads. We bless our grandparents. All the people that are responsible for this bent, we bless them. We truly bless them. And we're going to bless them for the rest of our lives. And Lord, in Jesus' name, we break the power of these iniquities by the authority of the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus. We break the spiritual power of every single iniquity represented in the people standing in this room and everyone watching online. We break the power of that and we declare it will not affect us one more minute, one more hour, one more day, and it will not affect our children and grandchildren and the generations that come after us. The spiritual power of this is broken over our lives, and we proclaim 
blessing to a thousand generations to our children and grandchildren. But these iniquities are broken in the name of Jesus. Talk about inner vows. You can sit down if you want to. All the, sit down there. You keep praying. Just let the Lord minister to you. Sit down. All the inner, all the inner vow or iniquity people, sit down. Now, if you have an inner vow, I want you to stand. We're going to pray for the inner vow. Yeah, so we're, we're getting good exercise. <laughs> and we're not finished. Yeah, inner vows. You're, you're nice people. You're wonderful people. But you didn't say it because you're not a nice person. You said it because you're hurting. And it was the answer to your immature self of how to get out of that pain, but you didn't get out of that pain. You just locked it up. So let's pray. Lord, we, we remember when we made that vow. And we remember that we were hurting. We remember that we were confused. And the number one thought we had is we don't ever want to come back here again. We didn't mean to be rebellious. We didn't mean to sin, but we did. Lord, we bring the vow to mind right now and we repent. We remember the vow or the vows and we just repent for whatever we said and we forgive whoever is attached to that vow, our parents, our siblings, a coach, a teacher, a pastor, a friend, an ex-spouse, an ex-business partner, whoever it was that was attached to this, boyfriend, girlfriend, we forgive them and we bless them and we commit to blessing them for the rest of our lives. Every time they come to mind, every time the situation comes to mind, we're gonna bless them, Lord. We forgive the person who put us in that situation. And Lord, now we come to you, Jesus, in this area that has been misshaped and misformed, malformed, this area of our lives that's now immature, we bring it to you and we submit it to the authority of Jesus Christ. This area, relationships, people, money, anger, whatever it might be, this area, we submit it to the authority of Jesus Christ. From now on, Lord, we're gonna to talk to you about this before we make decisions. The railroad tracks are gone. We're not following the same old tracks we've been following to fulfill the vow. From now on, we go to our knees to decide things. And Holy Spirit, Jesus said when you came that you would lead us into all truth and show us things to come. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you'll come into these areas that we have these inner vows. Teach us how to love Teach us how to live. Teach us how to react. Teach us how to treat people of the different sex, of different colors, of different, you know, backgrounds. Teach us how to do what we need to do in this area where we have this inner vow. But I proclaim healing now in Jesus' name. I speak the healing of Jesus Christ over you. All the people online, I speak the healing of Jesus Christ of Nazareth over you right now. And he's healing minds, he's healing hearts, he's healing emotions, he's healing memories, he's healing sexuality, he's healing abuse, he's healing abandonment, he's healing horrible words that were spoken and what that did to your psyche when you heard those words. He's healing all of that right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for healing us. Thank you for breaking the power of those inner vows over us. Let me, let me say this right now. So we're going to pray for unforgiveness next. If you want to keep standing, stand. If you don't have anybody to forgive, you can sit down if you want to. <laughs> this is a big one. It's hard to forgive when someone's hurt you really badly, you know. And you know you're right. You know they're wrong. And sometimes, you know, bitterness is a justice spirit. Bitterness just says, I'm not going to move forward until I see their obituary. Before, I, before they make it right. Before they come and ask for forgiveness. Whatever. Jesus said, that man was turned over to the torturers. Let me say this. 
Do you know that you've been forgiven over a billion dollars by Jesus? Did you know the most righteous man in the history of the world died on the cross because of you and me? We did something horrible. And Jesus had to pay the price. And the people who've done stuff against us, well, they've done bad stuff against us, but nothing compared to what we did to Jesus. So in the spirit of Jesus' story of the master and the servant, we're going to forgive. I want you to bow your heads if you would. Lord, there are people who have done us wrong and mistreated us and hurt us and wounded us and lied about us and talked about us and rejected us. Done very, very bad things. In your word, you say that vengeance is mine, I will repay. And that is a promise. I want you to listen to me right now. God's justice is perfect. And God's promise to you is vengeance belongs to him. He will repay that person or those people. He will. That's a promise from him. He will repay. You don't have to. Lord, we come to you and we realize that you have forgiven us a debt we could have never, ever paid off. And we remember that this weekend. We remember what you've done for us. And Lord, we come and we make a decision to forgive. From our hearts, Jesus said, if we had, we had to forgive from our hearts, and Lord, right now, we bless that person and we make a commitment. We will bless them until it's over, until the healing comes, until this is resolved, until we can heal their, hear their name and not have bad feelings, until we can actually even have compassion for them. Lord, we bless them right now. And I actually want you, just under your breath there, you don't have to say it loud, I want you to bless that person. Just say, I bless them. Whoever it is, parents, siblings, spouses, whoever it is, just bless them right now with your mouth. And that's the first time of many that you're going to do that. Lord, we are going to bless with our mouths. And as we do that, forgiveness is going to flow now from our hearts as you heal our hearts. And I pray right now in the name of Jesus for hearts to be healed, for hearts to be healed. We just let it go, Lord. We let all of it go. And we trust you. You are a mighty God and you're a faithful God. And we know however you do it, whenever you do it, you're going to repay and you're going to make everything right. That person that abused us, that person that robbed us of our innocence, that person who hurt our loved one, that person who rejected us and made fun of us and lied about us. That person that cheated on us, betrayed us. We bless them in the name of Jesus. We bless them in the name of Jesus. And we make a decision. We will not be bitter, hateful people again in our lives. We will not allow this to root within our hearts and to be the people that we become. We forgive, and Holy Spirit, I pray, flow from our head to our hearts, through our bodies and minds and spirits, and wash away the hurt and the pain. Wash away the hurt and the pain. Give us joy for ashes. Give us beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And we trust you to do that right now. We trust you to do that right now. And there are people, the Lord is deeply touching some of you in here right now. He's deeply touching you. That is the presence of God. He loves you so much. He, you're so precious to him. This, this time right now is something he planned for you because he loves you so much. There are people watching online right now that are being deeply, deeply touched and healed. This is literally a moment in your life that will define the rest of your life. Just keep your head bowed there for just one second. And I want to say something to you. Do you know how much courage 
it takes for you to stand. You know how much courage it takes for you to be standing. in the presence of God with all these people and being honest and asking for the Lord's forgiveness and Lord's healing. The, Lord, the Lord's proud of you. That's what, I, that's what I feel is the pleasure of the Lord as such humble, obedient children. Lord, thank you for your grace and mercy that sets us free. In Jesus' name, amen. You go ahead and take your seat. So let me say just a few words and I'm finished. Um, Proverbs 13, 22 says, A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Again, that's man or woman. A good legacy is intentional. We're talking about generational transference. That someone transferred to us something that wasn't good. But now we have a question, several questions. What is it that I want to leave as an inheritance for my children and grandchildren? Do I want to be a Jonathan Edwards or a Max Jukes? I want to be Jonathan Edwards. Proverbs 22 says, a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, loving favor than silver or gold. I want to leave my children and grandchildren a good name. I want to leave an inheritance to my children's children. And if I do that, Karen and I, that's what we want to do. We want to make sure that our children and grandchildren are blessed. And the inheritance we want to leave them, we... Our great-grandchildren may get some money, hopefully down the road. Some, I, I think our children and grandchildren are going to spend it, but they may get some money. You know what I want them to get? I want them to get Jesus. And if that's all they get, they're going to be rich. Here's another question. If I continue to live as I am, what legacy will I leave my children and grandchildren? In other words, are my intentions and actions consistent with my desires? Here's a question. Will my children have to spend years recovering from me? Karen and I spent 20 years recovering from our parents. And I led my parents to the Lord. Karen didn't lead her parents to the Lord, but Karen discipled her parents. I love my parents. But 20 years I spent recovering from my parents. I don't want my children to have to do that. And I'm not a perfect man. Karen's not a perfect woman. We're not perfect parents, but I can say... My children didn't have to, our children didn't have to recover from us. I want my children to have an advantage because of me, not a disadvantage. Right. And some of you are here, let me say this, some of you are here and you've been through hell. And I've shared a little bit about Karen, Karen's in my background. My background, you, you've got me beat by a long ways. Use what God has done in your life to be a healer for other people. Amen. See, Jesus resurrected when he came out of the grave, he said, touch me. He had scars. Put your hand in my scars. Jesus' scars heal us. And our scars heal others when they're redeemed. And I'm up here sharing what I'm sharing with you because Jesus, my scars were healed by Jesus Christ. I still have the scars, but they're healed. I still have the memories, but they're all healed. And so I use what God has done in my life to help other people. I'm encouraging you to do the same. See now, what God has done with you tonight, it's a testimony that you'll have for the rest of your life to share with other people. One more question I've done. Am I living my life primarily for myself or am I living my life to transfer generational blessings to my children and grandchildren? And I want you to have a good life. I want you to have fun. I want you to be fulfilled and all of that. Always with the thought in mind, how is my life affecting my children, my posterity. Wouldn't America be different if a lot more people thought that way? Yes. And so I want to pray for you. Lord, thank you for these precious people, this wonderful church. This has been a very sacred time when you did surgery on our hearts. When you set us free from things that we didn't even know we had. And we thank you for it, Lord. For your grace and mercy. You're just a wonderful Father. You're a wonderful Savior. And we put our trust in you because you're good. You're gentle. 
You're kind. You're loving. And even when we have failed and sinned, you still care very deeply about us. And I just pray for the residing presence of the Holy Spirit to be on all of us as we leave. Everyone watching online, I just pray for the Holy Spirit to just lay heavy on you right now in the hours and days to come because what he has started right here, he's gonna continue until it's completely finished. Bless these people. Thank you for what you've done in Jesus' name, amen.